You are listening to episode 248 of the Game Deflators Podcast. My name is John, and I'm joined by Ryan. Hey, everybody here at the Game Deflators Podcast, we like to talk about games. We recently picked up games we're currently playing, and we silver surf on a river of our own tears in this week's Inflation Deflation Challenge. That's right. We uh, went through with it and played Silver Surfer on the Nintendo. And, we made uh, him cry. You know, uh, played is probably a very strong word for yeah. this. I would say we, we mainly ran into walls and enemies and uh, things that we didn't think would actually kill us that did kill us. Silver Surfer happened at us. Yeah, pretty much. We got Silver Surfer. We got surfed. Uh, yeah, I like yours better. Uh, well, uh, of course, you're listening to a new episode of the Game Inflators Podcast. We'll talk about Silver Surfer here at the end. But first, uh, you can find the Game Inflators Podcast on thegamedeflators.com. You can also find us on social media at Game Deflators on X or Twitter or whatever to call it nowadays. Uh, you can find us on Instagram and Facebook at The Game Deflators. I didn't do the threads thing yet that you mentioned, but I will look into that. Uh, you can also find us on YouTube, and um, this week you were able to find us at Game On Expo. Yeah. So we'll uh, talk about that in a little bit here, too. So, current pickups. Uh, I picked up Magic cards, because that's just what I'm doing right now. I um, haven't been picking up any games as of late, but Magic is a game, so kind of works, right? Uh, I also picked up a Donkey Kong Lego set. So they recently released that, and I got like the main base expansion of like with donkey kong i gotta get the rest of it there's like a diddy kong a dixie kong and then a rambi set as well so i'm probably gonna be about 120 130 bucks in on those um, does it interact with the mario stuff yes yeah, technically an expansion for the mario set so you know I, I figured when my son's older um a lot of those lego sets over time they no longer sell them they're i guess you would say delisted i'm not sure but once they're no longer sold, those prices tend to go up in, in value quite a bit. Uh, in fact, there's some Mario sets that if you were to look at them now, they're no longer being sold in stores. It's brand new. And it at once was like a $30 set is like an $80 set or a $90 set. So I'm just not interested in seeing what that is when he's nine. Um, and I could have picked it up now versus picking up nine years from now. Mm -hmm. So that's really the mentality there, uh, to try and pick up as many of those as I can. So that when we are playing with Lego and say, he doesn't want to play with Lego down the road, then I'll sell him. you know, fine. That that's all good. Um, that's a first, my phone going off in the middle of a podcast episode. Uh, that probably wasn't even heard. Okay. So beyond that. Uh, playing, I've been playing White Knight Chronicles still. I am still in the underbelly of greed. Uh, I'm that one's a little iffy for me. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm stuck to an extent. Like, I know what I'm supposed to do there, but there's like levers and other things that you need to pull to try and get to different parts of the level. And there's like an elevator, doors that don't open yet. Like, it's the weirdest thing. So I'm honestly gonna look at a guide for this one. Uh, the game is still fun to me. I'm still enjoying it. I think the battling is uh, a little iffy at times. Um, just given that, like, you're, it's turn based action combat, if that makes sense. Like, you're in an action setting, but you're waiting for your little turn based wheel to yeah. go every turn. So you're just kind of a sit and duck. And it's not like you can go anywhere. Because if, say, I took my character and I moved 50 feet in the opposite direction, if I'm being targeted by an enemy, they're going to hit me. Even if it's a melee attack and I'm 50 feet in the opposite direction, it hits. So there's nothing I can do around that. So I'm just, just like, like an MMO. Yeah. So it, it's really weird. I'm just like sitting there. I'm like, okay, waiting, waiting. All right. I'm getting hit two or three times and hit waiting, waiting. So I'm literally doing like turn-based combat standing there in an action-based mode. It's the weirdest thing. Um, so I'll, I'll continue playing that. Uh, I did not play any Returnal, so I kind of put a, a pause to that because I've been watching Sons of Anarchy, and that's just kind of consumed my time as of late, which solid show. So if you haven't seen it, definitely check that out. Uh, and then lastly, I played some Magic. I went to a tournament for the first time in a few weeks. Um, so it's probably, I think, my second tournament since I kind of jumped back into playing some Magic. And I won. So it was good. I got second place the uh, last time I played. I got first place this go around. How many people? Only five. But it, it doesn't matter because, like, you know, regardless of the decks I played 
were the decks I lost against last time. Mm-hmm. Well, no. So last time I only lost against one deck, and that was my first matchup, and I beat him. Uh, and then the other deck was really the main part of a meta, and I beat that deck, and then uh, a red deck that I played. Um, so yeah, I played red green aggro with a little bit of mid range built in, and it worked out perfectly. So I ended up getting first place on that one. But what's funny is that we had 12 people prior, right? And I got the exact same amount of prize support for first place that I did second place with 12 people. So I was like, that worked out. You know, mm-hmm. like I could have gone one loss and one two games in that three round Swiss, and I would have got like 10 bucks anyways on the tournament. So uh, it was fun, you know, at the end of the day. So I do want to do some drafting here pretty soon, uh, see how that goes. Um, you know, so maybe we can get some people together to do that and uh, have some fun playing a different format. Yeah, sounds like a good time to me. Yeah. All right, man. Well, uh, I see NA next yep. to pickups, so I'll call that out. But you are still playing a different game. Yeah, I'm playing Final Fantasy IX still. I have made it to disc three. So are you going to make it to disc four is the question. And that is the question. I am like 20 plus hours into this baby. Really? That's it? Mm-hmm. Huh. I, well, it's probably like 24 hours or something. Okay, so you're about on pace. You just got to disc three? Um, Yeah, not too far in. Okay, yeah. So you'll probably get to like maybe 35 hours and then disc four will be about another 15 or so. I don't think it's that long. And these games are usually about 45, 50 hours. It's about what you end up putting in on average. Like yeah. what level are you? Uh, like, I think 27. Yeah, you're going to have to be, like, level... You're either going to be doing a lot of grinding, which is going to consume time, or you're going to level up as you progress through the different things that you're doing. But, yeah, you're going to have to be, like, level 60-something plus to be able to beat the game. Yeah, we'll see. So. But it's going pretty good. I really like the story of Final Fantasy IX. Uh, We've gone kind of through a lot of the really climactic moments where a lot of the major events have kind of happened and now things have kind of settled back down a little bit and our party has reunited as a whole i kind of just got to the airship moment in the game where i don't necessarily have an airship i just have a boat right now but it functions like an airship i can go a bunch of different places so now i'm revisiting the second continent again and I'm going back to the Black Mage Village um, to find out. Well, actually, you know, I actually just left the Black Mage Village again. But I went back there. I, I, it's a great story. This is one of my favorite Final Fantasies that I've played, probably. And I'm really glad to be going back through it again. So, yeah, I'll keep plucking away at this one. And I'll probably, you know, finish it in another couple of weeks or so. And then I can wrap up um, The Darkness and Pikmin. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, summer is still here, but it's it's going away. Summer? We've got like two more months of summer. Uh, yeah. Summer's done at like the end of September. And technically. Yeah, technically. All right. We'll see uh, if you're able to complete all three of these, actually. you got three games on the on the docket. Three up. Yeah, whereas I'm slowly taking my time. I mean, dude, I, I was actually chatting with Barry at Prime Edition because he's got uh, his baby now, too. It's damn near impossible, like, to do anything. I mean, he's walking now along the couch, right? So it's not like I can start up my PlayStation and start playing because the second he starts walking towards the TV, I'm like, nope, I don't want you, you know, staring directly into the TV, like, right in front of it because he stands up in front of it. So it's like, okay, I'm going to turn that off, and we're going to play with blocks. Like, that's what I do in that free time that I have. Um, and so that kind of sucks, but I get to play with my kids, so that works out as well. Uh, and then, of course, I play at night, but at night you start falling asleep earlier, right? Because you're wiped out for the day. So it's definitely interesting playing games as a dad. I think it's going to... We're going to have to see what I can get out of this um, gaming-wise. But, you know, I'm trying to get like 30 minutes here or there. Um, you know, sometimes an hour, hour and a half to play a game. And it's it's hard to build a game but i'm trying at least i'm doing some magic on the weeks during the weeks that works out Mm -hmm. well and you're playing like some magic arena that counts as gaming yeah arena is definitely your gaming will just evolve john yeah arena's become like pretty easy to play through just because 
you know, I'm set with the deck I'm playing with, and I can play my dailies, get that done, play five, six matches in a day. And since I'm playing burn, it's a quick, like, literally, like, we were sitting here and you were doing the outline, and within two minutes or three minutes, I beat somebody, and I was like, all right, cool, I won. Let's move on to playing our games that we're going to play for the week. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, it is an evolution of gaming, and not exactly the best of evolutions, but, you know, it is what it is. Not much I can do about it. All right. Let's dive into uh, some discussion topics here. Um, you know, we'll type, we'll go into our articles in a moment, but uh, Game on Expo. So this is our third year in a row attending Game on Expo. I would honestly say this was, I would say this was the best year so far for Game on Expo. Yeah, we it, had a good time. Yeah. So we did get to see Patrick of uh, Sega Saturn Shiro podcast while we were there. We saw our friends uh, at Premium Edition Games. Uh, they were present. Uh, we also got to see our guys um, that have Cthulhu, the uh, board game that we were playing a while back. Um, what else did we see while we were there? We talked to some indie devs, which was pretty cool. Uh, we'll look to have some interviews uh, here coming up pretty soon. Uh, so we've already got conversations going with some of those indie developers and their titles and what they're working on. So that'll be a lot of fun. And, um, dude, the video game scene there, I felt, was a lot stronger this year than it was in years past that we've gone. Mm -hmm. I mean, they had the multiple stages. Uh, they, they had it dark, which was nice, right? The years prior to we went, it wasn't dark like that. It was kind of lit up. And it really did help kind of with the ambiance of, of what we were doing there. Uh, all the TVs that were set up were fantastic with all the consoles. Um, tons and tons of arcades and pinball machines compared to prior years. So... I really felt that they nailed it uh, this year with the gaming. What I did feel was a little bit of a miss uh, on, I guess, on my end, is I was really looking forward to more like Dungeons and Dragons type stuff. And while there were a few folks that had D and D uh, materials and and whatnot, it wasn't as heavy as it was last year. Yeah, just the whole board game scene was a little bit light. Yeah, and so that was a little disappointing, but. You know, they can't control that, right? Like, they can reach out to as many people as they want and try to get a lot of these board game folks out there. And you're just not always going to get them, you mm -hmm. know? Uh, but it, it was nice to see things like uh, like GameStop was there doing some stuff. And um, I, I would the reason I bring that up is like, a big positive is that if you're getting companies like GameStop to go out to your event and having, like, Verizon, because there was, like, a big Verizon thing there, when you have companies like that going out, that means that the event itself is clearly growing to a point where you're going to attract more developers. You're going to attract more board game folks. Like it's going to get better and better as the years progress um, because you're you're being noticed, right? Mm -hmm. And then the guest lineup was sick, dude. I mean, there was. I mean, you had Nolan North, of course, who uh, is Nathan Drake. You had Christopher Judge, who's Kratos. Um, you had Kyle Bear, who we've interviewed actually on a podcast uh, as Ryu and Street Fighter. So tons and tons of voice actors that were there. Obviously, anime was a big focus as it is in uh, in other years. Uh, cosplay was a uh, was very prominent. And then that Nintendo Power Art Museum, dude. I was actually when we went in there, I was like, this is interesting. Like, I didn't know what to think at first, but then I started talking with the guy, right? And, and we were talking with him about like the whole reason for this art museum that he has, um, which is basically taking Nintendo Power magazines and showing the covers but then also bringing in the original art pieces uh which is i think pretty phenomenal to be honest considering it's nintendo uh you would think that they would have that close to the chest but apparently they didn't years ago and he's got all of these fantastic pieces has his own 501c3 that he runs for that and it, it was really cool so yeah yeah i enjoyed that piece so overall in my opinion and, and what we experienced at the event this year i would say for me it was uh you know as conventions go it was a solid like 10 out of 10 for me um you know and I, I have been to a number of conventions over the years obviously i have some of my own and this had a little bit of everything for everyone there yes board games were light but there were board games present they did have a board game area where you could play they had board game vendors tons and tons of art um you know you picked up some pretty cool stuff as well figures video games were very heavy this year for sale uh, pricing was pretty good for the most part. You know, I saw some vendors that were like over eBay prices, but I saw some that were under. So it was pretty average uh, on that end. So no, I feel like when you go to a con and you buy something there, I mean, you may be overpaying compared to what you're 
paying on eBay, but you're kind of there to spend money that you probably wouldn't just think to go and spend online. So people probably wind up splurging on that kind of stuff there and think, oh, you know, hey, this is probably like it's here in front of me. I could just get it or I could wait until I have this kind of money again because I'm going to spend it on something today. Yeah, you know, the only issue I have with like cons and when it comes to spending like spending money on electronic media specifically say i bought a game today right say we went sunday and we bought a game and i come home it's 40 miles from me right Mm -hmm. game doesn't work what do i do at that point right do i call the vendor does the vendor even respond to me what's my you know what's my warranty on that product when you go to cons there isn't exactly a warranty per se unless it's a, a reputable like bigger vendor it usually isn't a warranty for that type of stuff. And that's the unfortunate aspect of when you buy video games, specifically specifically at cons. Now, things like figures and artwork and all of that, like that's what I was looking for. Ultimately, I didn't find anything that I really wanted art-wise. I mean, I did, but I didn't want to spend, I think it was $75 on prints. I was like, mm, not not really in the wheelhouse of what I want to spend right now on paper. Um well, you're buying the art, not the paper. You are. You are buying the art. I totally get that. But it's it's one of those, like, it's massively printed, like mass production print. I really wasn't interested in spending 75 bucks on that. Like, I, I ended up finding similar artwork that I looked at yesterday on Timu. And it was like $8 mm-hmm. for like four pieces. So, you know, when I kind of look at it in that respect, uh, yes, you are paying for that specific art. And that artist, I do have their, uh, so Patrick actually uh, texted me. Uh, their information so if i want to buy something online from them i can uh but you know i just was not up to paying that type of money for prints specifically Mm -hmm. yeah well what else did you think of the events in general um i thought that the amount of arcade cabinets and stuff that they had featured this year was definitely up from last year and that was kind of the thing that drew us in i think a lot originally the first time we went back in 2019 like that's kind of how we hooked up with paul because he was over in that area there was that guy who was doing those like custom cabinets that were being shown off like i think that that's like always a cool draw is to see more of that uh the gaming space definitely seemed a lot more alive and full and a lot of people doing a lot of stuff like you said we ran into patrick over there he had a bunch of like different old systems set up on some great TVs and like being around that stuff. We didn't participate in a a smash tournament like we did last year, but it was nice to see that it was pretty lively. I mean, I'm not really a competitive fighter player, so I don't really have a place at there uh, to sit around all day and actually be interested in. But I know that that's a really cool scene that I would like to have alive and well in our area so i'm happy to see that uh yeah i did find some cool art i got this awesome like three different image lenticular poster that has like the original charizard blastoise and venusaur like trading cards on them it's pretty cool i just threw that in a frame today and hung it up um i love gachapon they had a gachapon station so i got a few of those things again love seeing that love seeing all of the different great um you know art in the artist alley not necessarily like the big pro print stations that are kind of in the middle but the artist alley area was um had some really nice things in it this year definitely looked like it was way more uh voice actors yeah than i think in previous years too so and i think that overall the the layout of the space was really nice i hate that we had to dump our drinks out before we could go inside but I guess that's the rules. It's just hot. When it's hot, you know, it's like I had ice so that my drink would be cold all day. And then it's like, all right, well, no ice now. But here's what's crazy. We got in. We They made us dump out our drinks, right? We walked into the place, and they didn't check our jugs for water. Oh, they asked me. Oh, they didn't ask me. Mm. I just went straight through. They didn't say anything. Yeah, well, I guess you could have broke the rules then, John. Well, I mean, what what did they ask you? Just like, what's in the container? They asked me if I emptied it, and I was like, yeah. Yeah, see? There you go. Like, what are they going to do? Shake it? I'm not going to force it. I mean, they could have. They could have, I guess. And There's then security. It, yeah, right. So, no, they didn't ask me anything, which is interesting. But, yeah. So, overall, uh, yeah, I think we're both in agreement. Game 
game on expo this year was great um definitely looking forward to uh potentially attending next year mm -hmm. and seeing what they have to offer but uh if you haven't attended in the past definitely look at this event and add it to your calendar all right so there's a couple things that uh we pulled up this week uh the first one i god this was like a week ago i think i have they may have already caught these guys but um Brazen Heist of Magic the Gathering Cards Rattles a Board Game Convention. And uh, this is uh, Cecilia Dianantasio of Bloomberg. So essentially, uh, a few guys walked into a board game convention. And Gen Con. Gen Con, actually, yeah. So that's a big one. That's not like a you know random, run -up, you know, little tiny convention and not a whole bunch of security. Like, it's a biggie. And uh, they basically walked out with a pallet, like a literal pallet of Magic Cards. Uh, valued at $261,000. And so a breakdown of kind of what they had. They had um, Commander Masters collector sets, 2,400 cards, boosters, so random boosters. Um, they also pulled promo packs and uh, new promo packs actually from March of the Machine. And that was about it on that. So in total, like I said, $264,000. But I just think it's it's crazy how expensive Magic has become. Like, that's new product. You know, we're not talking established product. And the article specifically calls out, they're like, they're probably going to try and dump this right away. And the main reason being is that product, once it is, like, in market for a, a little bit, yeah. those prices are going to go down. Yeah. Right? That product is not going to be as, as big as it is right now. So they have to kind of dump it quickly. And, or, you know, maybe they don't, maybe they crack open every single pack, right? And that's what they're doing is cracking open packs and selling loose foils or opening up their own shop. Who knows? But it looks like they had them on, on camera, you know, faces and everything. So they're at large. Well, and they know who these people are, supposedly. It seems like they may have been identified by Indianapolis police as uh, New York based suspects. And it turns out that they have been to Gen Con before and even had a Kickstarter for their own board game called Castle Assault. Huh. So I tried looking up a little bit more and I, I couldn't really find anything, but that's according to the Bloomberg article here. So maybe these guys are just really dumb. Like, I'm sure that they were planning on going to Gen Con, saw this pallet sitting around and were like, we could totally jack that. Yeah, And the other guy was like, we could totally jack that. And then they did, and they left. But it's like, these had been people who were planning on being at Gen Con. Yeah. So, like, for them to be so embedded in the industry and to just, like, do this kind of just general douchebaggery, it's like, come on, man. Like, what are you doing? And here's the real stupidity behind it. I was really thinking about this, too. I'm like, why didn't you go in cosplaying? Yeah. Right? Like, if you went It was like, Sailor Moon and the Hulk, sir. Like... Yeah, like when you start considering that, like if they would have gone in as cosplayers and had heavy makeup, different hair color, you know, hands. It was and a crime of opportunity. Visible. It wasn't something they were intending to do, I don't think. Maybe. I think they just acted. Well, maybe. Yeah, you're right. And maybe it was just a quick, oh, yeah, we can jack this. It could have also been premeditated. You never really know of those things. But based on the fact, look, they're either really stupid and they premeditate and are really stupid or opportunity like mm -hmm. you said regardless not a good scene not a good scene right so it's kind of crazy and i feel bad for those uh, business owners like that's a lot of product to just lose yeah well i mean it's also not a lot of not an easy product to move either so when those suspects are eventually caught given that there's enough it's not like they were masked individuals and you don't know who they are and it broke in and they stole like a black lotus or something like that right and that, to me, I think is a little easier to get away with. This seems a lot harder to get away with, right? Yeah. You, you got pictures. You're, you've are you got everything out on the internet right now. Like, they're going to get found, and that product is going to be found as well. So, you know, business owner, they'll be all right at the end of the day. And I'm sure they haven't I, – I would hope they have insurance uh, for stolen goods. Yeah. So, unless they're in on it, who knows? All right. PlayStationLifestyle.net. So there is a video of a PS5 with a detachable disk drive that's leaked, and it says Michael Leary. Did you see the pictures at first before this video came out? Uh, yeah, I saw the pictures at first, and I was where like... Where it was just like the top portion, like you saw like where that break was in the side of the shell and yeah. then above it, but it, nothing below? It pretty much looks like a much... Like at first when I saw the picture, it looked like the same exact damn thing. 
And then you look at the video and you're like, oh, that's actually much smaller. Is it? Yeah, like, dude, this guy's manhandling this thing. Well, now, the thing that's stupid in this video here, this video does not have a detachable <laughs> no, disk it, drive on it. it. It's, it like, doesn't. modeled into the side of the plastic. Like, that is not at all what the article is suggesting that it is. Yeah. No, I noticed that, too. So, it's very interesting that, like, and that's the video. bad still. Like... All the renderings, like the one that came out the other day that was like the picture, like maybe it's going to be a little more low profile, but like I was hoping it would look different, not like almost the same. So I'm very disappointed that the PS5 is just going to be like still gaudy as hell, but just smaller now. Yeah. Well, here here's the funny thing with the this video. You couldn't take a better video? Like, was he well, rushing? I mean, yeah, probably. Like, if this is even legit. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. But we'll see. Like, the biggest thing that makes me feel like this is not a legit video is because it has an a, a part of it in the molded plastic, the disk drive. Yeah. So if it's supposed to be a one skew and then a detachable disk drive... This doesn't make any sense. Like, if they're going to make a smaller one that has the disk drive built in and one that doesn't, then they're not really d doing what they thought that they were going to be doing. So, yeah, we'll have to wait and see what happens. But I am excited to be that much closer to getting that revealed. And then after that, we'll just be waiting on the Switch 2. And then this generation will be kind of set for a while. We won't have to worry about any more new console speculations. Well, that's until Xbox releases a mid mid year uh, mid mid cycle console, right? We'll, post we'll have, mid, yeah, post mid console cycle thing, yeah. Post mid early next gen. It'll be the Xbox Z Series Z, right? No. Right. Yeah. So you have the X, you have the S. So they need in excess, right? Is that is that the band? I, I don't I don't remember. I don't know what you're going for here. No, Joe. you don't remember that band name. No, you're on a limb. Uh, in X S, yeah, Anyways. I N X S in X S. So we need an Xbox I and an Xbox N. We already have the X and the S, and it will be set. We also need better jokes. We also need better jokes. That is correct. Yeah. <laughs> so let us know what you think about better jokes and the new slim <laughs> PS5 console somewhere on the internet somewhere out there will is going to be listening to this episode and he is just gonna be like ryan you, you don't get the joke that john's trying to tell <laughs> yeah yeah he'll, he'll message me later okay uh you got this next article this one you sent to me yeah so the uh let me pull it up here legend of zelda tears of the kingdom dethroned as best game of 2023 so with the super success release of baldur's gate 3 and everybody's just rampant talking about it. Like, people are not letting down how good this game is, how diverse your choice base is, how much it's worth it to, like, see so many different people playing at the same time and be getting that kind of communal, like, oh, what did you do? Oh, what did you do? You know, how are things different? And this is going to be like almost an endlessly replayable RPG with all of the different mechanics and iterations and interactions that are possible. So I am, I don't know, man. I really am looking forward to being able to play this at some point in time. Probably not anytime soon, but it sounds incredible. Yeah, I, I'm tempted to buy it on my PC and play it on there. That's but, where it would be best. Yeah, but it, but again... When the hell am I going to game? That's the big issue. Like, I still need to beat Factorio. I still have other games I got to play. So that's a downside. So it's almost like, do I get it on PS5 so that when I do have that downtime, I don't have to go on PC and such. But we'll see. I need to get some PC games. Uh, so that might be on the list. You know, speaking of that, did you see, though, that somebody's released a child mod? Mm -mm. And somebody's like, well, we'll know where to send Dateline when it comes <laughs> down to, uh, you know, relationships in, yeah. in Baldur's Gate. So... Uh, that's an, an interesting thing. And, you know, it's this article in particular, though, calls out the lack of reviews, right, on Baldur's Gate. So they're like, oh, it's a small win because Baldur's Gate only has 17 critic reviews to Zelda's like 116 or whatever it is on there. The thing to point out, though, is if you were to go on Steam for this, 
overwhelming majority of people see this game as highly positive, right? So if you look at Steam reviews, it's like 150,000 reviews or something like that on Steam. Yeah. Uh, and it's still very, very high. So I could see this definitely being the highest rated game of 2023 for sure. And Zelda remaining unseated on that throne. But we still have so much left to go for this year. We've got uh, Starfield, Mario Wonder, uh, a whole bunch of other things like Alan Wake 2. Like, I mean, not everything's going to be like pushing almost 100 out of 100. But, I mean, we've still got a lot of room in the 90s category. Like, this could go down. And I've heard people say as much that this might be one of the best years in gaming when it's all said and done, when we get to see what happened in 2023, like all the payoff from the delays in COVID. I mean, this could really be a big year. So I'm really looking forward to, you know, seeing where everything kind of winds up and, and what that conversation is going to look like. I mean, I'm probably not going to wind up playing Baldur's Gate, but I'll probably play a couple other titles that are going to be on that top list before the end of the year for sure yeah you know what was funny is i was uh you know i like to check out my threads and whatnot um on like facebook and whatnot and there was a guy that was like oh i'll get the boulders gate as soon as i finish my backlog of a thousand games i'm like what <laughs> you're never gonna play boulders gate at that rate man but but everybody's excited about it and i am too i just haven't got to that point so when you start whenever you decide to go ahead and play it let me know um, I may just join you. All right. Play Sounds good. The and then we time. can kind of compare notes. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. It'd be pretty cool. And I, my wife wants to play it too. So it might be one of those things like she Will she I, let you play without one and two? I don't know. I'll probably have to just have my tell own account. Just tell her the three is, is part of the title. It doesn't mean anything. There weren't two before it. Oh, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Because she's always. Yeah. Actually, there's a third one too. If you look at the Beamdog remake. Because they did like kind there of a, a 1.5. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I didn't like the original one. I uh, She and I started to play that. And mm -hmm. we just couldn't get into oh, it. Oh, that's when you guys switched to the other one, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because we beat Neverwinter. And then we decided to jump into Baldur's Gate. Or Yeah, it was Baldur's Gate. Couldn't get into it. Because it was AD&D? &D. Uh, yeah. It was just. And graphically, it's just so old, dude. Yeah. It's just hard to get into something like that. All right. Uh, let's go into our inflation deflation of the week. And uh, this is Silver Surfer on the NES. It was developed by Software Creations, published by Arcadia Systems. It was directed by Graham Devine and Rob Landeros. It was released in November of 1990. It is a scrolling shooter, and it can be top-down and side-scrolling. Mm -hmm. uh, reception is a 4-ish out of 10. <laughs> uh, there's a good reason for that. Uh, do you want to read the synopsis? Because yeah. it's not wrapped here. Battle over strange worlds and forgotten realms. Fearlessly fight to defeat the evil plans of the magic domain. As the surfer, you must destroy the five elements that will form the portal machine. Only then can you keep the evil magic warriors from swarming through into our dimension. Uh, this is a kind of Mega Man style. Choose your own, you know, map and boss that you want to go at kind of formula. But like John was saying, we've got top down and side scrolling shoot 'em up levels where you better have your thumb ready to go click, 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 click and never stop because you need to mash your way through this difficult as hell shooter. Yeah. Now, this is one that I play. I, God, I want to say I played this on the podcast a long time ago. Um, like first two episodes. And it was difficult back then. And it even felt more difficult now. And if you've never played Silver Surfer, you know, as Ryan said, you're like click, 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 click constantly. It's not like a shooter where you're holding down the button and things are happening. And you're picking up items and you just kind of make your way. You're constantly clicking the fire. Um, the enemies... Yes, you can get the patterns over time. That makes sense. It's all good. But that's hard when inanimate objects that you just barely scrape and just touch kill you. Right. Well, and everything is a one hit kill. Yeah. No matter what. And <laughs> yeah, it's it's one of my least favorite things when it comes to like a superhero game is what they did in this game. Like we're dying to fish. And frog tongues and running into a bridge. Like, these are not things for a superhero co to contend with. A superhero should not 
have to combat fish and frogs. Like, yeah. I get the jetpack wearing lizard men with guns. Those are good enemies for uh, the Silver Surfer. But just because he surfs doesn't mean that fish aren't his friends. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, with the bridge, for example, like there was a, that was the most random thing. I didn't even realize that that was going to happen. We're going through this tunnel and we just kill all these fish and there's lizard men on the top of the level because you could theoretically go to the top of the level instead of the tubes on the bottom where the fish are. And Ryan's going along and three fish come from behind him. Mm -hmm. I have never, well, I mean, I've experienced games like Contra and stuff where characters come up behind you and shoot you. But I wouldn't have gotten that from this. Yeah. Like, this isn't the type of game I would have pictured, oh, I'm going to have enemies come from behind me and kill me. So, Ryan, of course, uh, the next playthrough went up, and he just touched the bridge, and he died. And he's like, Did, what What happened? Yeah. Right? Like, it was just baffling. And so it's like that for just about every part of this game. Like, you, there's areas where, and that's a big issue, too, is that there's areas where when you're top-down specifically, you're like, I can't touch that. Like, there's no way. But you can. You can go over it. Like, it's, mm -hmm. you know, certain pieces of the map or level, you're like, oh, yeah, I could totally go across that. And then randomly something will be in your way and you die. Yeah, there's no clear indicator until you die that something is going to kill you. Unless it's like an obvious enemy or something. But yeah. as far as terrain, you are very just kind of like guessing and hoping for the best. Well, we there was a wall in like the first area that we played in and you were like, no, it's going to kill you. It's gonna, I'm like, Ryan, I can't go any higher. It was a clear example of like a wall that in any other part of the level would have killed me. Mm -hmm. But for whatever reason, in this specific section did not kill me. Mm -hmm. And then I died by a frog tongue. Yeah. And then I died by a pole. Then I, like, and you're talking, like you said, you're talking silver surfer, superhero. He shouldn't be dying to those types of things. Yeah. Like it's just, it makes no sense. Um, so difficulty wise, this is stupid hard um, as far as uh, scrolling shooters are concerned. I've played much easier shooters and it, a lot of things that just don't make sense. Right. It's just, it's okay from a gameplay perspective outside. If you took the difficulty aside and some of the stupidity with like the, the landscape or and whatnot, it's actually not a terrible game when you consider that it's just a sheer stupidity of like, touching a wall and you're dead or touching a ceiling and you're dead or a one hit and you're done. Like, that to me is what really brings this game down. Yeah. My suggestion would be that rather than play this game, uh, if you go to YouTube, there's a guy named I finished a video game. He makes really, really great long form retrospective content on old video games and, and even some more modern stuff too. Uh, but his icon is, the crying silver surfer that you will see at the end game screen. So I would go to his YouTube channel, look at his icon, and then watch one of his videos instead because you would be way better off spending, oh, I don't know, three hours and 53 minutes watching an entire Parasite Eve retrospective and having to see that crying silver surfer image one time than trying to play this game for 10 minutes and seeing that icon about a hundred freaking times. Yeah, that, that's always the most hilarious part is every single time that you lose a life, Crying Silver Surfer comes yeah. up. It's not like a game over, Crying Silver Surfer. No, I want a shirt with this guy on it. Actually, that's a, that'd be a hilarious shirt. Actually. People would get it too. Yeah, people have played this game and totally get it. I was telling John, I would be so mad if I was a kid and my mom brought me this. I would just be beyond like this you, is you throw the whole mom away. That's what you do at that point. Yeah. I mean, I've played some hard Mega Man stuff and not gotten very far because that's how Mega Man rolls. Yeah. But I could get farther in Mega Man than I can in this. This is like Mega Man meets the Turbo Tunnel or something. And it's not even that great of a game. That's the worst no. part. Like, it's so hard to be hard. Like, that. I think that's the biggest thing is that it's just difficult to be difficult. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I wish we had a turbo controller so we could see. If that helped at all, not having to constantly mash. I mean, I got one. Um, I don't think there's one on... There probably is one on NES that I'm not aware of. Yeah, there is a turbo controller. Just like the joystick thing, I believe. Mm. All right, well, brass tacks here. Complete in box copy right now. We'll run you 125.45. 45 That peaked at 150.25. Uh, you didn't put the date on there, but I'm guessing 2021. Uh, that is trending down. 
A uh, loose copy is 27.45. That peaked at 34.02 in November of 2021. That's trending up for some strange ass reason. Um, you know, I think it's fair to say this game is inflated. <laughs> like, I'm just gonna cut to chase on that. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, hundred percent inflated. Uh, there are far better games that you can play than Silver Surfer on the NES. Um, not worth it in the slightest. And my, I would say that four out of ten is pretty accurate when you look at it on that scale. Yeah, I feel like Sil- Silver Surfer is one of those heroes that is well known and even known outside of the comics because they tried to put him in movies and stuff before. But I feel like in mass, he's probably never been that successful, which is why he's fighting like, I don't know. I didn't know half the bad guys in the game and frogs and, and fish people like they, I feel like they saw surfer and they've, they were just like, give him aquatic foes. <laughs> Well, I mean, you had the lava level. We had uh, who you were calling um, Pickle Face. Pickle Face. The Emperor was Pickle Face, uh, according to Ryan. Fire Lord was like hands coming out of lava. Uh, the aquatic one, I don't remember the name, is an alligator of some sort. And there was two other levels. I don't remember which ones they were. But uh, yeah, it's just, it's not good. And, you know, there's a reason Silver Surfer comics don't go for as much money as, you know, other characters that are out there. Is he sad? Is is being sad a trait of the Silver Surfer? Like, didn't Galactus eat his whole planet and then make him his bitch or something? Uh, honestly, I don't know. I've never read Silver Surfer stuff. I only saw the Fantastic Four, the bad one. I I just know that Silver Surfer comics, when I see them for sale, like, first Silver Surfer, or whatever grade value, doesn't go for as much as some of the other stuff I've seen. <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason, I'm sure. So, all right. Well, this has been... Episode 248 of the Game Players Podcast. Uh, we are going to look into a game for you next week. I don't know what we're playing yet, Ryan. We'll figure it out. And episode 250 is coming up too. So we'll have some special stuff planned for that. Sounds good. All right. Well, I'm John. I'm Ryan. And thanks for listening. <laughs>